I always love when they tell us that. So it's looking at those SDGs right there, one through five. And the way that we'll go today is we'll uh, first start with uh, introductions. So everyone on the different islands can meet each other. We think this is a great low carbon way to have uh, statewide summits. And then we'll show a couple of short videos on the UN Sustainable Development Goals because we're moving now from the UN Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. And the one aspect of it that's quite crucial and significant is it's actually every state now will have to report how they're working on these 17 goals. So actually the United States won't just be able to say, dear developing countries, tell us how you're doing. We'll actually be able to look at these 17 goals in each community, such as here in Hawaii. And that's why we wanted to do that in our first year of focusing on the first five. So I want to thank everyone for participating. It's great to see everybody in the different rooms on all the islands. Uh, we'll start here at Manoa. And I'll just introduce themselves, name, maybe major, and issue in this interest. And then we'll go to the other islands. And as long as everybody lets know that they can hear each other, and then we'll go into the videos right away. Thank you. I just turn this on here? <laughs> Try one more time. Can I hold it? No. no. Just, just hit it once. Oh. Okay. My name is Jen. Uh, I'm from Detroit, Michigan. I'm here working on my master's of science in entomology. I study chemical free methods of uh, agricultural renovation, minimizing uh, pest damage. Uh, and turf and agricultural systems. So I am passionate about human rights as well and uh, found out about this through my student affiliate program over at the East West Center through EWCPA events. Perfect. Thank you. Can I use the same one? Sure. <laughs> All right. Okay, what am I waiting on? Oh, oh yeah. Kind of hard to see from that angle. Okay, there it is. All right, I'm Missy Sterney. I am a development coordinator for an organization called um, Hula Napua, and we are um, working to eradicate sex trafficking here in Hawaii, um, focusing primarily on minors. So we're actually building a um, a home to rehabilitate them um, up on the North Shore. Perfect. I know you were involved a couple years ago on our Human Rights Day at the State Ledge, so yes, it's great to still partner. I'm Candace Akobe, and I'm also with Ho'olanapua volunteering um, for the last five years now. Perfect. Thank you so much. Maybe like hit it once and then wait a second. There we go. Okay. Hey, my name is Anna Jeliberti Epo. I'm a writer and I am a journalism student here at UH. Excellent. Uh, and I'm interested in um, civil rights issues in general and uh, people's issues. I mean, human rights. Absolutely. Okay. Um, hello, my name is David Kang. Um, I'm majoring in political science, and my co-president and I helped establish uh, two RIOs here at UH Manoa, the United Nations International Affairs Council and the Human Rights Association. And I'm Don Peel. I'm with the United Nations Association, Hawaii, uh, Honolulu chapter. Great. We'll go to the neighbor islands now. You see the trio of amazing women activists in one room. Do you want to start? Hey, hi, I'm Megan. I'm from Scotland. I'm just here in exchange doing a politics class, so I thought this might be quite interesting. So that's it, really. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, I'm Jane Panic. I'm from the American Association of University Women, and we hope to have a session jointly with UH about human trafficking. We had a speaker, Kathy Zhang, from Oahu in November who came to speak at Zanta. She was really excellent and we hope to have her back. So this is just to give us some more ideas. Great. I'm Margaret Alcock. I'm also in the 
I'm also in the University Women Group and also in the League of Women Voters, and I'm very interested in this subject. Thank you. And then the, the next island? I think there's one in the back. Hi, this is Anne and Annika from Maui. We're interested in everything to do with human rights. Great, Anne, it's great to see you. All right, so um, there's a couple of things going on since the last one. We do these every month. And right now, one of the most exciting things that's taking place is the UN Human Rights Council is actually meeting in Geneva, Switzerland. And women's rights or human rights is a major topic on there, especially since the Beijing World Summit in 1995. And also next week, they'll actually start the UN Commission on the Status of Women, and that'll be held in New York for two weeks. So a lot of different things going on at the UN level. But what we try to do with UNA and the Hawaii Institute for Human Rights is bring the global issues down to the grassroots level and then concentrate and see what we can do here in our community, not only at the global civil society. So this is the first video we have that's looking at transitioning from the Millennium Development Goals to the Sustainable Development Goals. So we'll just show that real quick. It's only a couple of minutes. So that was uh, the first one. Uh, second one is pretty good. It just expands on it a bit. In the year 2000, leaders from 189 countries agreed on a vision for the new millennium. They wanted to end extreme poverty in all of its forms. So they made a list of eight goals called the Millennium Development Goals. And they wanted to achieve these goals in 15 years. One of the leading organizations working to fulfill these goals has been the United Nations Development Program, or UNDP. We're present in more than 170 countries and territories. We champion the goals so that people everywhere would know what they were and how people could do their part. We funded projects that helped fulfill the goals. We helped countries accelerate NDG progress by breaking down the silos and working across sectors. We acted as scorekeeper, helping countries to track progress. As a result, the number of people that live on less than $1.25 per day has dropped by more than half. The number of primary school age kids who don't go to school, down by almost half. The number of people getting life-saving treatment for HIV, increased by over 15 times. Child mortality, down by almost half. As much progress as we have made together, there's still a lot more to do. Over 800 million people are still living on less than $1.25 a day. One in nine people on our planet goes to sleep hungry each night. Deforestation remains alarmingly high in many countries. Oceans are becoming more acidic, threatening food security and marine ecosystems. And about one of every six adults in the world is illiterate. Two thirds of them are women. We think those are tough numbers, and so do leaders from the countries where we work. 
So in September 2015, they agreed on a new set of goals to help finish the work we all started in 2000. The new goals are called the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. We have made significant progress in the last 15 years, and we think there's plenty of room for hope, for action, in the next 15 years. Today, the world is more connected by technology. We know more about how to balance the three pillars of sustainable development, social progress, economic growth, and environmental protection. However, our climate is changing. Our planet is transforming. And there are more people on Earth than ever before. We at UNDP believe everyone can have enough of what they need living within our planetary boundaries. And we are working around the world to make this happen. Our goals to reach by 2030 are to eradicate extreme poverty, protect our environment, and much more. UNDP has 50 years of experience working with countries to make this a more prosperous, this healthy, in inclusive, health. and sustainable world. This week, Join us. Rick talks about sustainable development goals. Uh, we'll do one more only, and then we'll um, have a brief discussion about some of the issues maybe and things coming up, especially the work that's being done at the grassroots level, if you'd like to highlight that and the work that you're focusing on. And that's really the, the goal is finding all the different NGOs and nonprofits that fit each one of these 17 sustainable development goals, and then organizing in the state of Hawaii together, because too often everybody kind of just works in their silos and doesn't always rec recognize interconnectedness. So we think this will be very valuable. The United Nations General Assembly was the scene of a celebration in 2015 when 193 member countries adopted the Sustainable Development Goals, a unanimous commitment to end poverty, fight inequality, and tackle climate change. We need action from everyone everywhere. 17 Sustainable Development Goals are our guide. They are a to-do list. Yeah, I know. Hilo does those things. Hilo, your mic is on. Blueprint for success. The SDGs are an agenda to balance human prosperity with protecting the planet. Imagine there's no countries. UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador Shakira asked global leaders to imagine a world where we achieve the goals by 2030. While fellow UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador Angelique Kijo underscored a focus on Africa and developing countries. But the universal agenda is important to all nations, as leaders from developed countries also pledged to make the goals a reality. Poverty, growing inequality exists in all of our nations, and all of our nations have work to do, and that includes here in the United States. And that's why today I am committing the United States to achieving the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals build on the success of another 15-year plan. Created in the year 2000, the Millennium Development Goals sunset at the end of 2015. The MDGs halved extreme poverty, achieved equal primary education for girls and boys, and dropped HIV infection by 40% among many successes. The SDGs go beyond the MDGs by improving the lives of everyone everywhere and create a better world for future generations. Today, we are 193 young people representing billions more. The youngest Nobel Peace Laureate, Malala, calls on world leaders to keep their promise to every child. Each Lenten we hold represents the hope we have for our future because of the commitments you have made to the global goals. And Pope Francis advised world leaders to put humanity and the environment over politics. Los gobernantes han de hacer todo lo posible a fin de que todos puedan tener la mínima base material y espiritual para ejercer su dignidad y para formar y mantener una familia. 193 nations unanimously committed to the Sustainable Development Goals. It is so decided. But the journey starts here. 
Now's the time to take global action for local results and move our people and planet towards a sustainable future. Right, so if you would like to share maybe some of the important work that you're doing, I think it would be great to, to feature, especially as you're working on ending sex trafficking here in Honolulu. Okay. Um, oh. Thanks. You guys are so great. Way to be there for me, isn't it? Okay. Um, so I am actually new with the organization, um, and so hopefully you will <laughs> be able to jump in here. Um, but what we, our focus um, ultimately is to build a um, facility up on the North Shore for um, the children rescued out of sex trafficking here in, um, in Hawaii. Right now it's specific to Oahu, but we do have um, contacts on the outer islands that are able to, hi, I don't know where they can see me, um, they can see um, who can get those children to us. Um, so that's one of the things we're working towards. Um, is building those partnerships with outer islands and you know getting volunteers on those outer islands who can um, connect people or those um, those children to us um, right now the facility has been acquired um, we've gotten it to the point where we're just waiting on permitting and um, we all love this island but sometimes things take a little while to happen um, and so we're just really at that point um, we hope to obtain our permitting in the next year um, that's kind of the the um, extreme um, that we're at like hope I mean if we get it tomorrow we're we're ready to get going. Um, we do have several fundraisers coming up. Um, we're going to start a capital campaign and other things to, um, to go directly towards the building. Um, but in the short term, so that's a long-term goal as in, in the next actually just two years. So it sounds a lot, but it's also really close. Um, we hope to open the facility in the latest, the fall of 2017. Um, but right now we um, have several mentors going into the um, I guess that, uh, what is it, the juvenile detention center here, mm -hmm. which is actually where our, um, the girls are being Help. kept um, because they're not a place for them, which is so horrible to know that they have been victims and then they're going to turn around and, and be, they're not actually treated as criminals, um, but they're still being held there, you know, and so that's just... Um, obviously the lesser of two evils but still just not the best place um, the facility we hope to or we will be building um, will be just a place of healing um, and restoration um, there's goals to um, implement like career training programs and things like that for um, the the girls to eventually once they are healed which I mean it's a process and it's going yeah. to be a lifelong thing um, they said that um, the studies have shown that it's like what um, a child has gone through is 40 times worse than PTSD. Um, and so that's just... For war veterans. Yeah, and that's just like crushing, you know, and we know how disabling it is to war veterans, and uh, um, so just to know that that happens to children. Um, so that's, once again, just probably like a program that's working in action. It's called our Starfish Program, that, um, and we have several mentors that are trained um, to go into this facility and to meet with these um, children on a regular basis. Um, and then we have a whole lot of um, programs going into schools. Good. That's part of our, one of our goals is to, um, to end the supply right. of these children specific to Hawaii. Like, um, so Hawaii prevention, is, huh? Uh, I'm prevention. Sorry, prevention, yes. exactly. Um, because right now it said there's two to three hundred children a month that are reported missing. Um, and it said that um, 90 percent of them within 48 hours will be approached by um, someone trying to draw them into um, to sex trafficking and so that's something we're trying to um, to prevent from happening to watch for to be mindful of um, we actually were at an or um, uh, an event this weekend and the um, that's through the National Guard but it's like a teen challenge type program and the girls were there and we were just talking with them as they came by our booth and they a lot of them actually knew people who had been um, in or who had been lost essentially to sex trafficking um, and so that's kind of where we're at, um, just a lot of education, awareness, um, trying to gear up and do as much as we possibly can um, towards this facility. 
Um, anything you'd like to add? Um, just to, to clarify a little bit about the home as well. Oh, yeah. um, it's a long-term home, not just a, a treatment facility where they're coming in and out, so that they're actually getting all the, the um, treatments that they need before they graduate out of the home. So mm -hmm. for some, it's going to be different, um, but it's probably going to be right around a year, um, just depending on how they're doing. So it's a long-term shelter and, um, well, not a shelter, a home, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, um, and more like a treatment area. And they'll get schooling, they'll have, you know, all kinds of um, therapies, dance therapy, um, psychological therapies, physical therapies, you know, and so we're really working towards that goal. And then um, just being in a community and just sharing, you know, because when people hear, then they, they realize what's going on. And it's, it's still amazing to me that people don't understand that this is such a huge problem in Hawaii itself. So, yes, thank you. And I think you mentioned everything else, so good job. <laughs> well, one, and also to add on to that, thank you very much for all of that. Um, in the U.S., there's less than 100 beds available for minors um, that are rescued from sex trafficking, which is just, like, terrible. It's, it's horrible to have this problem, but we have to address it. Um, and so this property will have 32 beds um, when it's complete. And so, I mean, that's, that changes some numbers significantly, and that's just in our little island home. Um, so, anyway, we have tons of information here yeah. for you guys, so we'll pass out at the end. Um, Perfect. But thank you for having us. No problem. We definitely want to do that. And then it's also important to when there's this global campaign, everybody's organizing, it's another way to reinforce the amazing work that's being done here in Hawaii. So we want to try to do that as well. So we look forward to partner. We'll show this last video. It's, um, it's the one that was just adopted called We the People, focusing on the UN Charter. But it's also looking at the global goals. And then we'll start the, the documentary of ending sex trafficking in the USA. So thank you very much. We can be. We must be. The first generation to end extreme poverty. The generation most determined to fight injustice and inequalities. The generation that saves the planet from climate change. And this is how it will get done. The global goals. A 15-year plan for everyone, everywhere, with no one left behind. We will live in a world where nobody anywhere lives in extreme poverty. Where no one goes hungry. Where no one wakes in the morning asking if there will be food today. We will live in a world where no child has to die. Diseases we know how to cure. And where proper health care is a lifelong right for us all. We will live in a world where everyone goes to school. And education gives us the knowledge and skills for a fulfilling life. We will live in a world where all girls and all women have equal opportunities to thrive and be powerful and safe. We cannot succeed if all the others can We will live in a world where all people can get clean water and proper toilets at home, at school, and at work. We will live in a world where there is sustainable energy for everyone, heat, light, and power for the whole planet without destroying the planet. We will live in a world where our economy is prosper. A new wealth leads to decent jobs for everyone. And we will live in a world where our industry, our infrastructure, and our work. best innovations are not just used to make money, but to all make all our lives, lives better. better. We will live in a world where prejudices and extremes of inequality are defeated. Inside our countries and between different countries. Where people live in cities and communities that are safe, and progressive, and support, and support everyone who lives there. Where we replace what we consume. Planet where we put back what we take out of the earth. We live in a world that is decisively rolling back the from threat of climate, climate change. change. Where we restore and protect the, the life in our oceans, oceans and seas. <laughs> We'll restore and protect life on land, the forests, animals, the earth itself. With peace between and inside countries. Where all governments are open. And answer to us for what they do at home and abroad. And the justice rules. With everyone equal before the law. Where all countries and we their people work together in partnerships of all kinds to make, make these global goals a reality for everyone, everywhere. These are the United Nations Global Goals for Sustainable Development. Let's, Let's get, get to work. work. Let's make it happen.
So that's the. It's a good right wing group right there with that one. All right. So um, we'll now begin with our film. The film is A Path Appears. Uh, we'll be showing it a couple of times because we won't be able to show the entire thing to all the neighbor islands today. Tomorrow we have our 11th annual Human Rights Day at the Hawaii State Capitol. We'll be showing it there, but we're also premiering uh, videos made by high school students on all 17 of the Sustainable Development Goals. So Iolani and Waipahu students made 17 short videos, and it's actually going to, the UN was so impressed with it, they're creating our own website on the global website. So every other country in the world has a, the United States we want, Jamaica we want, but we'll actually have our own website that'll be the Hawaii we want, and it'll feature those 17 videos. But then there'll also be e-consultations where people will talk about the 17 goals and discuss what they think is most important and significant. So it's, it'll be kind of exciting, but that'll be tomorrow from 12 until 5. And then on Friday, if you enjoy the film, we'll actually be showing it at 12 and at 4.30 twice, and we can share with the flyer with you. And we're also showing He Named Me Malala. So we're showing both films on Friday here at UH Manoa. So I uh, want to thank everybody for coming, and now we'll uh, begin the film. What time's the Friday film? At noon. Give a damn about their fellow man. They look around and huh? they see oh, good. Uh, what's right. ¿Cómo están? Buenas. ¿Y por qué no están estudiando? What's important about what Nick and Cheryl are doing is they're showing us the good side of man in, in some of the worst situations. You get to see some real joy. And that's, you know, it's an important part of storytelling is you got to have a little joy out of it, you know, where you don't feel like there's any hope. Nick's work has been going on for a long time, talking about the things that most people don't talk about. Is it usually the woman who beats you? And you can see every one of these problems in every country in the world, even here in the United States. My grandfather was my trafficker when I was a little bitty girl. I was in seven different foster homes. I came here in all of them. Sex trafficking and, you know, the buying and selling of children uh, it's something that we can't fathom. So I went online. I didn't know that I would have to have sex with them. Um, Maria. <laughs> Which means it's a pimp because, well, oh my God. I feel like I've discovered this darkness that lives in our country. There's always going to be some form of trafficking, but what you're really trying to do is create a groundswell of attention. That's the signal. We focus our attention exclusively on arresting Johns, making their lives miserable, to be quite frank with you. The more men we can get involved, it's important so that they understand and they make it a shameful thing. It's a sad life. Yeah, it is. It really is. There's women who have gone through that and have come out and decided that they're going to do something about it. Are you tired? Yeah. Are you ready to go today? No. I would not dare come out here by myself because they could pull me in quicker than I could pull them out. You just open up a place and people can come and stay and I thought, let's start there. Magdalene House is a wonderful example of a chosen family. There are good reasons for us to look at these situations and go, well, what can I do to help? Let me just save you from it because I know that I could. And you realize that, that there's a lot you can do. A Path Appears is made possible in part by... We believe empowering all women is one of the best ways to ensure that children have better and more opportunities in life. IKEA Foundation. Intel believes that education and technology access for girls and women is one of the smartest investments that we can make because every girl has the power inside to change the world. As part of our global commitment to human rights, Hilton Worldwide is working to end child trafficking and is proud to support The Path Appears.
and by the Edna McConnell Clark Foundation, the W.K. Kellogg Foundation, the Novo Foundation, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, the Induna Foundation, the Artemis Rising Foundation, the Ford Foundation, Deerbrook Charitable Trust, Vagisil, Ina Brown Bond, Nina DeClerc, the Clifton Foundation, the Embry Family Foundation, the Akasha Project, and Revlon. Major funding provided by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. One is serving a 25-year sentence. The willingness that Nick and Cheryl have shown and that they continue to champion uh, to stand up for the least among us, the most vulnerable, but to do it within the context of this great continuing struggle for human freedom and dignity is such an inspiration because stories are powerful. Our new project is called A Path Appears. The title is from Lucian, a prominent Chinese author, who said that hope is like a path in the countryside. At first, there is no path, but as more and more people walk again and again, a path appears, meaning a solution appears, and that's what we take from that title. It's about innovative strategies for making a difference. We're going to take you from Haiti to Chicago, from Colombia to Kenya to Boston. As we take our journey, we're going to be inviting along actors who have varying degrees of experience on these issues to try to highlight some of these global problems. One of the worst problems that face women around the world is sex trafficking. I've been reporting on sex trafficking internationally for almost two decades now. But here, we're focusing our sights on sex trafficking in the U.S. And partly that's because I don't think that most Americans appreciate how much and how brutal the trafficking is right here at home. Sex trafficking is actually an enormous problem in the U.S. that we are only just beginning to peel back the layers of complexity. I think most people's kind of idea when you say trafficking, right, is girl brought from another country, chain to a wall, men with AK-47. I mean, it's a very specific kind of image, right? Um, and it, it rarely has anything to do with American girls on the track. They see that as teen prostitution, and they're, they're not real victims. And so helping people kind of integrate those two concepts, I think, has been a big battle. Sex trafficking is when someone is made to engage in prostitution through force, fraud, or coercion, um, manipulation, control. Sex trafficking is a form of modern slavery. It's pimping children in the sex trade. It could be an economic lure. It could be saying, if you escape, um, then I'm going to go after your sister. It is said that there's between 100,000 and 300,000 sex trafficked people in the United States in any one year. 
but that's just an estimate. People don't realize that sex trafficking is one of the top criminal enterprises. It's easy. We have to come at this with a lot of humility because it's not something that any country has, has solved. It's, it's a very challenging issue. It's an issue that every single country in the world is struggling with. We're going to look at what can be done specifically to address it. We'll look at how underage victims fall prey to traffickers. We'll look at how law enforcement and justice officials are changing their strategies. And finally, we'll look at those efforts to build exit ramps to help people escape and rebuild their lives. My name is Shauna. My grandfather was my trafficker. He came to me, to my bed in the middle of the night. And then I remember him on top of me when I was a little bitty girl. I mean, you can look at trafficking in any sense that you want to, but really, it's a manipulator. And I learned that later on when I got a pimp. When I was out here, I would stay down towards the hotels because you can get the men that are coming in from out of town, right? And if we kept going straight down through there, there's a place where you can take your tricks. I know where I'm at. And then there's the famous Drake Motel, right? <laughs> home of the stars, home of the drug dealers and the prostitutes. This is the hotel that I used to stay at. You could get the businessmen. The money gets to be a little bit better when you get to this area here. There was every kind of trick, client, John. Monday morning was my best day because the professional men had been all weekend with their wives and their families. And so Monday morning, they would stop on their way to work. Pillars of the community, everyone from A to Z. Nashville isn't the worst city for human trafficking, but this is middle America. This is our backyard. And in that respect, it's, it's representative of the trafficking problem that is all across the country. It's a sad life. Yeah, it is. It really is. We cry a lot together. We get mad at each other. But bottom line, we're the only family we have sometimes down here. Sabrina is this heartbreaking woman we met out on the street here in Nashville. She said she had chosen to be a prostitute, apparently to finance her drug habit. But she also described what she was doing as just heartbreakingly demeaning. And they come back here and sleep. They'll try to put their clothes in um, like plastic bags. And when they sleep, it's, it's urine infested, it's feces infested, things but like Sabrina, that. But Sabrina, why, why does somebody who is selling sex have to sleep here? Because, you know, they're because earning. they're so addicted that when they get $20, they can't wait they... long enough to get a room. I see, because they're spending it on, yeah, on drugs. Or... they can't wait. Mm. Wow. It's not that uh, they're bad people, they've just lost. First time I put that crack pipe in my mouth, didn't care about anything else. It's very degrading, it's very self-humiliating. Would you like me to get a little graphic? When uh, you hop in a car, and like you pull the skin down, and you have to dig out lint, and they say, is this the best? How do you feel good about yourself? You go get another crack rock that you don't feel for a while. Mm. That's how it is. Yeah. I mean, from the public's point of view, they see teenage girls out there in the street. Uh, nobody's holding a gun to their head. They're hailing cars. They're wearing utterly inappropriate clothing. They certainly don't look like anybody's enslaving them or forcing them to do what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And so they say, okay, you know, this is voluntary. It's too bad, but that's what they want to do. Yeah, and you think in your head, if that's your choice, what are the options? <laughs> but what the truth is, is that it takes a lot of failed systems and communities to get them out there. And that's why it takes communities 
to bring him back. There's this tendency to think that, oh, these are terrible problems in India and in Nepal, but we have this huge problem right here at home. Well, I think that some people are getting hip to the fact that it's become an area where business travelers in particular come in, they exploit kids, they leave. It's interesting to be in Nashville with Ashley Judd, who is right from this area. Sometimes I've worked with people who are new to these issues, and Ashley is not like that. I mean, Ashley has devoted a lot of time and effort and travel to understanding the issue of sex trafficking around the world. And so even in our area, there may be a growing awareness, but a reluctance to admit that we have our own problem in Williamson and Davidson counties. One of the bottlenecks in addressing human trafficking is that there is no place for women on the street to go. There is a shortage of shelters, residential programs. And here in Nashville, they have a program that is very promising, that is being replicated around the country that we want to take a look at. Thank you for having us. And this is a wide variety of folks, and I just want to do a quick, quick orientation for you guys. Just Becca Stevens is a Episcopal priest who was looking for a way for her congregation to become active in social justice issues. And the one she focused on was sex trafficking. And perhaps that was because Becca herself, as a girl, had been abused. So the stories of these women resonated with her. Hi, I'm Tasha. This just has been a challenging year for me, but in spite of, I'm still standing. Mm. Hi, my name's Larissa. This is my first day of work. Yeah. I'm so excited that Larissa and Brenda are here. Yeah. New women. When I interview girls who are out on the street, then I find that most of them come from disadvantaged communities or often girls of color, low-income communities. But you also do find some white middle-class women from the suburbs. <sighs> the forgiveness thing is really difficult when you've been through the kind of trauma that we've been through. When you interview them a little bit more, then over and over you find that there was some instance of incest or sexual abuse in their background that left them emotionally devastated and vulnerable to exploitation. Hi, I'm Ashley. I'm a grateful, recovering, depressed, codependent, major <laughs> self-harmer, <laughs> love addict, love avoidant, adult child of alcoholics addicts and sex addicts, survivor of all forms of sexual abuse, including incest and rape, and about that, I have no shame. And I am... I think that shedding the shame of child abuse is the fulcrum for being able to speak openly and confidently, giving the toxic shame back to the perpetrator, getting it externalized and putting it back where it belongs. So I'm really comfortable in a setting like that. And I'm pretty lucky that I didn't end up in a similar situation. But I'm grateful to be here and grateful to know how to take care of myself. So it's good to be with my family. <laughs> Welcome to the circle. The women who come into the program share a common story. And the story goes something like their first rape between the ages of 7 and 11. And on average, they hit the streets between 14 and 16 years old. All of them have been raped. They all carry those universal issues of sexual violence on their backs. My name is Bianca, and I am a work in progress. <laughs> They're all addicted. They're all dirt poor. I mean, not a penny. You don't come off the streets no matter how long you've been out there with any money. They all have criminal records. I'm free today. And that feels good. Mm -hmm. I'm free. <laughs> so thanks. <laughs> but really, the boot camp for prostitution is child rape. And the way that women begins to sell themselves on the streets and become addicted is roots is in trafficking. And trafficking's roots are in vulnerability and childhood trauma, and it's all connected. was on drugs so I was sent to live with my grandmother and her husband he was my step-grandfather and um, he molested me and I don't really know how early it started because I was probably a little bitty girl by three or four or something I mean it was mm -hmm. yes. early early yes I just remember him in my bed every night 
and then his kisses and kissing me and kissing me open mouth. And he was an alcoholic and it was always this stench of alcohol, but I always remember that being in my life, like I didn't know that it was right or wrong. Most of my pain goes back to when I was 11, because my dad, he sexually, yeah. mm, like, not to say we actually had the intercourse part, but he fondled me in ways I didn't feel comfortable about. I was in seven different foster homes. Then uh, I came in. here, in all of them. Wow. Then I, um, a lady adopted me, and I was molested in her home. And I, one thing I know, I didn't know that it was wrong. Your mom is an addict of some kind? Yeah, she was an alcoholic, and she was doing cocaine. She was 17 when she had me. There was a few, uh, a few different men that she would bring home. Uh, but she's used to tell me to suck on their penis like it was a lollipop. And so and she's the one kind of taught me how to, uh, to do oral sex when I was six. It happened so much that it seemed natural, like it was supposed to happen. When your mom's teaching you stuff, you know, um, and that is your teacher, you would assume that it's right. I remember going back to my mother's when my grandmother passed probably 12 or 13, and that's when she um, kind of traded me to her drug dealer. I remember being at um, a door, and she knocked on the door, moved to the side, and he opened it. And I remember coming in and not thinking anything, but that's the, um, my mother injected me with a needle in my foot, and that's when the drugs first hit me, and that's when all my fear disappeared. I, I would say that Shauna is my hero. She is living proof of the horrible adage that incest is boot camp for prostitution. And as is also often the case, uh, her own drug addiction was introduced to her at a very young age to help her be compliant sexually with adult men and to help her numb out. And so, you know, none of these problems exist in isolation. And I must say that I love my mother and hate the disease of addiction. Absolutely. And it took Absolutely. a lot to get to that point. Yes. So there's addiction in the home. There's sexual abuse in the home. There's neglect in the home. And then, you know, the girl or boy, her or himself becomes an addict. And all of that is this horrible maelstrom that creates being trapped in forced prostitution. And that, you know, is Shauna's story. And it's also, unfortunately, a very universal story. I stayed with that man for six years. He used to beat me, you know, it was a drug addict. It was horrible trading me to drug dealers. And I said, I'm leaving. And I didn't have anywhere to go. So I ended up on the streets. And um, uh, that's when I met my first pimp. I think it's interesting that some women don't know they've been trafficked. And that that's a new word that women are learning. They had seen themselves as victims with drug dealers or pimps, but they never knew that they had been trafficked. That was something that happened somewhere else. I really thought I was taking care of us, if that makes any sense. I didn't really see myself as being pimped out, trafficked. The first year, it was exciting. And there was all these girls, and I got all these clothes, and there was these drugs. and. And it was really great. And I didn't know what a pimp was. I didn't, I didn't know. And there was all these lies that were told to me. And then like the second year, I would watch other girls come in and I would sit back and I would see him tell them the same lies and this and that. And, and I was like, oh, wow. I mean, did you feel a, a real emotional bond for him? Did you feel he was like your boyfriend? Well, I have to tell you that I grew up without a family of any sorts real. And so all I ever wanted was a family and to be loved, right? So when I was alone on the streets, when I came up, he had a wife, and she said, you can call her mom. Mm -hmm. And then he was dad, and then you're gonna have all these sisters, and he would take me to his mother's house, and that was grandma. But if you really think, a pimp's job is to manipulate. It's my manipulation, so he knew better than I did that all I wanted was a family and to be loved, right? But yeah, that was my dad. Let me 
ask you uh, whether the law should go after pimps more aggressively. John, I think so. How many of you think that that should be more of a priority for law enforcement? It be, it's about you know, I was arrested 167 times and he was arrested zero. And I would have did life in prison before I would have testified against that man. There has to be a better way than to go against the women to try to get the women because they're not going to because of fear, right. because of Stockholm syndrome. So, uh, you know, they knew that man was pimping me for 10 years. Everyone knew what was going on. But all they wanted to do was come after me. That man had bombs yeah, but, and that man right, had bombs. I wasn't going to say anything. Yeah, that's the reality of it. Though. There has if to be we, a better way. If we are not willing to, well, to speak up, then, then there's well, got to be a better way. Yeah, there has to be well, yeah. a better way. So this is going to be a back road to Murfreesboro Road, and there's a place up here where women bring tricks also. Part of my journey was driving around with Shauna and seeing my own community differently. And then there is a little store across the street where they hang out. Now I look at this greasy spoon where I thought they had the perfect grilled cheese sandwich. I don't see that girl falling asleep there. Yeah, yeah. Sitting on the bus stop, yeah. We passed a couple of women, and she immediately knew which one had been forced in prostitution and was sitting there exhausted and defeated. Whereas the story I make up in my naive mind or my mind that doesn't want to see the problem right here, oh, she just got off a tough shift. Look, she is a guy. I know her. Oh, yeah? Yeah. But Shauna really taught me a lot. You know, I can see things more realistically now. No, I don't know her. I know him, though. What are you doing? Hey, how you doing? It's Shelly money. Hey, what's up, Shelly? How you doing? Shoot, I'm clean, living a good life. Get up off them streets. So he, so he is a pimp, and he's a gorilla pimp, and that girl, he's oh, yeah. working. He would take and make her work the street and take her money to buy his dope. And if she doesn't get out there and do what he wants, then he'll beat her ass. I've seen him do it to girls. I'm like, damn. I didn't really realize the degree of my beatings until after I, uh, I came into the Magdalene program and I had breast cancer and I lost all my hair and I really got to see the road map that was on my head. All the scars all over. Oh man, I got some scars. But I could never really get help in that situation either because what he would do is he'd put my head under cold water until the bleeding would stop instead of taking me to the hospital and letting me get the stitches that I really needed. Drugs is what kept me sane. That's how he would punish me. He would take my drugs away. Drugs at this point, this is crack Coke. cocaine. Crack, crack yeah, cocaine. I smoked it, a whole lot of it. What people say about the tattoos is that it's kind of like a, a cattle rancher branding a, a tag, cow. so you can tell which cow is yours when it's out there. That was um, my very first tattoo that I had before I met Nettie, and I was tagged by a pimp named Longhorn. He was a horrible man, and I wanted it covered up, and I went to this tattoo Wayne, and he put a snake that, on me. That was long. It was the long Longhorn. Horn was written and in. then it was a snake, and then I went to jail, and I read in the Bible that the serpent was the sign of the devil. I said, oh, I don't want a snake on me. So I got out and I got this bright idea to get it covered up. And um, I was with Nettie. And I remember that I wanted a panther. And his wife said, um, no, she can't get a panther. We don't want her to have a panther. Put some roses on her. And so this is supposed to be two roses. But I don't see it, do you? I was loyal. I was like a dog. Every morning he would go eat his breakfast, right? And he would never eat it all. He would leave some on the plate for me. And that's what I would eat in the mornings. He would bring me his leftover. That's what I would eat. Wow. Oh, that's bizarre. The... <laughs> <laughs> So oh, my head's starting to hurt. <laughs> I know. Wow. So you it's a wonder that I have any sense, is it not? Well, you know, it's... It really is post-traumatic stress, you know, it's just... Yeah, you, you, you know, really I got a check when I first got here for PTSD. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so... And I was not the same person you're sitting here talking yeah, yeah. to now. You have to get the gist of that. I'm, I'm totally a 360 turnaround, different person. So you're with Nettie uh, yeah. 10 years. 10 years. You're traveling 
all over with this whole stable of women? Yeah. So how does he travel around in like a minivan? He bought an RV, custom-made RV. East Coast or the whole country or the where is he country, from? Wherever. We could stop uh, truck stops along the way. Can you think if you got seven girls, you stop for an hour and they can each come back with $300. I mean, that's a little lick of money. When we were in Salt Lake City, Utah, we worked from 9 o'clock in the morning till 9 o'clock at night. When we came here to Nashville, we worked from 10 o'clock at night till 6 o'clock in the morning. Now, when we went to Washington, D.C., we left the motel room with $100 because we knew we were going to jail. Okay, because the paddy wagon, the paddy wagon comes and picks you up. Okay, you pay him $100, and guess what? Then they let you out, and, and you can work for the rest of the night without messing with you. It basically is a bribe to the cops. Mm-hmm. We come here to Nashville during the summer times because it was good money. There was four other girls. We had to make at least $1,000 a day. Everybody in the stable had to earn $1,000 a day every day? Oh, every day. There was no days off. I was probably with Kenny Mack for, I think, close to eight years. And I I've run away from him, and he has come and found me. One time whenever I ran away from him in Memphis, I went to El Paso, Texas was working in a strip bar, came off the stage, and there he was. Oh, my God. He's out of jail, y'all. Uh, Don't steal no cars today. <laughs> <laughs> you remember me? Yes, Who am I? I remember your name. Shelly Money. So, like, what are you doing? You got a girl out here? Three? <laughs> Three girls. So you waiting on one to come back now? Yeah. How much do you expect her to bring? 40. No less. That's a new rule, 40. That's so it. if she comes back with more than 40, do you expect that she'd be up front with you and give you the full whack, or is she only going to give you 40 because you told no, her that she was the minimum? No, she'd give me 40 because I'm taking care of her. You know, I got to her a room and place to safe to stay and uh, drugs. So, you know, I got The one you're waiting on now, what's her habit? Crack. Everybody would be crack. Everybody. So you supply her dope? And if she if she comes back then with less than forty, I mean God forbid, what it's gonna what's uh, gonna happen? I got a different system than you know other people. I try to treat them right. Like in the morning before they wanna heat, I give them a, either a, a V eight or orange juice. And then so you make sure she's got a little something in her stomach. Got to have some. And her feet, you know, I like to take care of their feet. How do you take care of their feet? I take them to a pedicure, manicure, once a month. So how long have you been out this time? Ah, uh, 68 days. So how long did it take before you were running girls? How many days? How many minutes? Same day. <laughs> Same day. OK. All right. Any girls out here that need any help, you tell them Shelly Money, she'll help them get off the street. All right. All right? Nice meeting you. OK. And there's no way that I would ever come out here by myself, never. So usually when I'm doing this, I'm with Sheila, or I'm doing it today because I'm with you all, I would not dare come out here by myself because they could pull me in quicker than I can pull them out. What have you been doing? You're clean. I'm clean for three years now. Well, I'm not, bitch. Get away from me. Get away from me, hoe. When you get tired, I'm not a hoe no more. When you get tired, let me know. Oh, yeah. Give me another. I got another. I got another. What's your number? 320. I am tired. You hear me? Are you tired? Yeah. Are you ready to go today? No. No? Well? But I'm tired. I just want to get well one more time. <laughs> Go on. I love you. I've been there. I know. God, she used to be so beautiful. She's messed up. Bad. There's a trail that goes up, and right where that sign is is a spot you can sit or walk on up to the motel, and that's where I was my last day. And I was sitting up there, and I was like, man, I had drugs, I had money. I just could not go on anymore. You know what I'm saying? I was so tired. And I was like, if you are a God, save me. 
I walked back out to Murfreesboro Road, right out there, and the police picked me up and took me to jail. And I was so tired. And I remember I just laid down in the back seat of the police car. And that's when I asked the public defender to get me a Magdalene. I just couldn't do it anymore. Okay, I need Defenders of prostitution are often arguing that the majority of prostitutes are not trafficked, that this is a victimless crime, sex between two consenting adults. But the fact is that even if these prostitutes end up not working for a pimp, the majority of them are actually trafficked into the business at a very young age as girls. Who are the victims of sex trafficking in America? It's runaways. It's children in foster care, children from not just poor neighborhoods, but from middle-class neighborhoods. A guy on the internet that they've met wants to meet them and likes them and thinks they're interesting or pretty. It's social media reaching into the bedrooms of our children to bring them into the life. In the United States, one in seven young people between the age of 10 and 18 will run away. 75% of those runaways are female. They're so vulnerable, they fall through the cracks. We need to pay much more attention. More than 300,000 girls go missing each year. Um, in the United States? In the US, and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children has estimated that 100,000 of them are you know, sold for sex in some form. This isn't foreign women smuggled into the US, yeah. these are our neighbors. But so see, I'm in... not even aware of that because yeah. it's not on the news. Exactly, you know, when you right. tell me that, it's that's invisible. shocking to me to, to even hear that. For me, you know, sex trafficking is something I had heard of, but I never fully understood. That. To be honest, when I, when I heard that it was, um, it was about sex trafficking, it's I thought, oh, well, you know, that's, in the United States, I don't know, isn't it like, isn't it more just prostitution? Isn't it, we live in a free country, isn't it more willful? I don't really know how valid this is, but just, just me being completely ignorant. One of the attractions of Boston is that it has this model of my life, my choice, that seems to actually be working to some degree both in prevention and in helping these girls kind of start over. The girls are waiting for you guys to come in. Audrey Morrissey endured many years of prostitution, years of drug addiction, and now is devoting her life to help other girls escape that kind of world. Well, the young women, there are a lot of traumas, so some of the deep questioning that you might ask, you're not going to be able yeah, to do that. Fine. So really just observe and not a lot okay. of questions because they might okay. not be able to handle Sounds good. If lot. I get out of line, slap me down, okay? Well, Count I won't slap you. you down, but I'll say <laughs> cut it out. My Life, My Choice provides mentorship for girls who have been trafficked or have been referred to the juvenile court system girls in some way me. and is being replicated all around the country. Hi, how are you? Hi, we go into facilities that house girls between the ages of 12 and 18 and we do a 10-week session how pimps recruit, the media, self-esteem, sexuality, so that they have the information that they need in case they are ever approached by a pimp. Like you hear a lot about pimps and being really physically abusive. It wasn't so much she was abusive, it was the emotional connection that really kept me with her. The nurture and the love and you're so pretty and baby and every time I got hit, oh let's pass this up, let's do your makeup really nice. Like we have a fabulous staff of mentors where we pair adult women survivors with girls who are either very high risk or who have been exploited. How old were you when you started? 15. What did your mom think of you when you were like doing all this stuff? At the time, she didn't really want to know. He asked me to walk the street. And I was like, honey, I don't walk on no street. I'm not no hooker. And he smacked me. He said, little girl, I am not playing with you. Get out this car and get my money. I have razor blades to my throat. I have the regular that I had to run for my life. My life, my choice is working with girls who may have run away. And when a girl runs away, she is so vulnerable because she needs to eat. She needs a place to stay. 
she doesn't have money. And the pimps just home in on girls like that and fill that vacuum. And then the next thing the girl knows, she's being sold 10 times a day. Sitting down and talking to me too. Sure. I, I really appreciate it. Mrs. Manis just got back home. She was in a group home for a while. Yeah. For well, I was in a hospital for nine months and then a group home for like three. When we have visits, this is kind of what we do. We'll meet at the, like a coffee shop. Or a Savannah is a 17 year old girl who turned out to have been trafficked when she was just 13 and who ultimately was locked up in a house by a pimp and truly enslaved in any sense of that word. So one day, I, I think I was 13. I didn't really know a lot about anything. Mm -hmm. So I went online and I wanted to, I don't know how I came across like this website for like, you know, like sugar daddies, guys would pay for your stuff and you would have sex with them. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that I would have to have sex with them. Mm -hmm. I just thought they were gonna, I don't know what I was thinking, but I just thought that, you know, they would buy me stuff and mm -hmm. just cause I was pretty, I don't know. But yeah, he took me shopping and then we went and I still did not understand what was happening, like completely, even when we went to the hotel room until it happened. And then I, I was still a virgin, that, but that was my first time with an old guy and he said he was taking some pictures. And um, I knew, like I knew what kind of pictures they would be, like I thought. Mm -hmm. But I didn't really know that they would be put online and I would be doing all this other stuff. Mm. Society's idea of, of what a woman is that sells her body. You think of this woman who's like hardened and, and callous and she doesn't care. But when you think of that, you don't think of someone like Savannah, who has done all of those things that we think of a prostitute as doing. You don't ever think of someone being vulnerable and being broken and wanting to get out of that life and wanting to be a little girl again. You don't think of them as little girls. He, he hit me a few times. And then he, he had a gun and he pointed it at me and he was like, you need to do what I say. He was like, I will kill you. He thought that the moment he put the gun to my head, like he had me, mm. that I wasn't gonna leave. To see Savannah was to see the face of the reality of what it is in our country. And that was the most profound thing for me. You think about your partner, who you love and love having sex with. You think about having to have sex with that person that you love and adore 10 to 20 times a day. Now think about survivors and kids in life. They have to sleep with 10 to 20 strangers per night. Who would ever choose to do something like that? daughter has been um, missing for the last three months. She has a history of having been missing on and off for about two and a half years. Latiana had been communicating with her. Right now, one of Lala's girls is missing. She's been missing for three months. She's the typical young girl who, you know, I hate my mother and that, you know, that rebellious teenage thing. I'm stuck. I don't know where else to turn to. You know, I turn to the police. I turn to the courts. I don't have nothing else to turn to. When is her? Oh. It's just killing me. Everybody who's at the table this morning works with kids and is really interested and invested in kids being safe. I believe there is a CRA child requiring assistance, a warrant. Um, Once we realized that things had escalated, we were making attempts to locate her. You know, there are people out there that are willing to buy people. Watching this Poor mother who is like, I just want help. The girl that's missing, I've been seeing her for about six or seven months. Uh, she's 15? She's 15. And we have communicated the whole entire time. Up until about three weeks ago, she stopped responding to any of my messages. I don't know why. It could be maybe someone has her and she can't reply. So I'm really worried right now. We know that a girl that goes on a run at some point will be approached by a pimp. So these are the most recent pictures. Is that hers too? It looks like someone else's name is written on the arm. 
It's so much darker and it's so much more complex than I ever understood. I don't know how much of the general public I represent in this, but we don't take it to be um, something that, that is that is plaguing, you know, our, our world. So when you say there may be children that are falling through the cracks, this isn't falling through the cracks. I mean, this is like, this is a, 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 an earthquake. Maria is a working class mom, a bus driver who cares deeply about her daughter and has been fairly stern in creating a disciplined home environment to try to protect her daughter. Unfortunately, that has led the daughter to become more rebellious and to run away repeatedly. You don't know if she's in Boston now or out of state or... I don't hear from her. I know through everybody else that hears from her. I haven't heard from her. Um, you spend the weekend in Walpole. In oh. Walpole? Who lives in Walpole? Her boyfriend. It's not her boyfriend because she's gonna she have has, a boyfriend. I got it all right here how on my see, phone. How you seeing this? She went over her aunt's house uh -huh. and she left her her page open. Who's she writing that to? She's so. writing to um she to her friends. So this means that. How is she on but Facebook? How come it says like January? Oh, because this is so. These are the texts between this guy, Risque Don Mob, yeah. and I'm her. That big now. And she doesn't know that this is open. Let's look on back page, looking at uh, Walpole, and see if any if there's Does any name. It's pop, this, so this is a website called Backpage. It's notorious for um, uh, people looking for sex and selling sex. And a lot of people will go there looking for it there. It's, uh, let me just go closer to the window. It's, the signal's kind of pretty, pretty faint. Wait, we're going to find her. Like, don't. I just run out of the streets. I want her to get help. She needs help. Okay, here we go. Um, right. Uh, there's Walpole. There's a mixed Latina catering to your needs. Emily? Can you click on it? Yeah. Would you recognize? Uh... Yeah. Let me, well, let me see, and then I'll... Um, Maria. Maria. That's her. We just have to make sure. Ooh. Is that yeah. Okay, that's her. Oh my. Okay, look at this is look at but look at look at well, listen, listen. We found, her. we found her, but listen. We found now her. we have her. Now we have her. We found her. We found her. We found her. We can give the police this information. Okay. There's a number. I'm gonna call Donna. Uh, but Okay, Donna. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm gonna call Donna, yeah. the human trafficking unit, and tell her there's a number that she's posted on back page. Which means it's got to be. I mean, it's a pimp because. Well, oh I mean, my God. What is it? Hey, my name is Emily. I'm 19, Puerto Rican, right? Oh. Yeah. Oh, I'm Um. Uh, Donna, we just we found a back page listing for Naomi in Walpole. In Walpole? Yes. She has pictures up and everything. This is her. It's her. It's her. So can you text me the phone number that she's using? Um, uh, okay. Yeah. Yep. I'll, send, I'll text you that right now. They can, you know, now they've got a phone number. And now they, they have her, they have this. I just wanted to find her. She's yeah. out there in danger. Yeah. I mean, I know it's devastating, um, but this really, I mean, this is going to be the way to get her back. I mean, you know, hopefully she'll be, she'll be back tonight. She'll be, they should be, I mean, if they... Absolutely. I'm so desperate. You know. It's been three months already. I'm so desperate. I don't think you should do anything with this page yet. I don't want to tip any right. tip anyone off oh, that the pimp who was exploiting her. Um, you know, let me that. search that number though and see if it's advertising oh. another girl too. Okay. Yeah. Because the, the same pimp may have multiple. At least this way, you know, for sure. She needs help. For sure. So what happens with these men? Will they find them too? I mean, because at this point now, he's explaining a minor. I'm going to forward the other pictures to the other detectives. She's, I mean, she was also advertised uh, in, on other 
sites, Not besides Backpage, uh, and also in New Hampshire. So she was taken to New Hampshire um, uh, as well. Um, and, um, and there's another girl with the same phone number, uh, and at least one of them, maybe a couple. So it's evidently somebody who's running a couple of girls and, um, you know, um, so, um, I mean, they have a way to get her to, to yeah. find her now. Yes, they really do. absolutely. Yeah. Hopefully she's going to be okay in, in, in a couple of hours. They mm -hmm. should be able to. I just wanted to find her before it's too late. Girls, my daughter Savannah and her sister gave me this. Oh, really? um, Beautiful. Probably five Mother's Days ago. Oh, yeah. nice. We love that she's home. Her yes. little sister and I, we, when she's sleeping, we go, she's here. Aww. She's home. <laughs> I can't even describe what it's like to yeah. not know where your child is. Yeah. I would go on her Facebook every single day. I would say, "Where are you? Where are you? Just call us. Just something. Give us. Give us some sort of, you know, sign that you're alive." And then one day, um, there was a message from her. And she said, Mom, I made a mistake. I trusted the wrong guy, and now I can't get out. And her friend said, I just talked to Savannah. She said she's coming to Winthrop. I called the detective and grabbed her. And um, I met them at the police station. And she sat on my lap, and she started to cry. And she looked at me, and I said, um, are you OK? And she said, no. And um, she started to just talk. So I knew at that moment that we were going to get her back. Mm -hmm. Could have scoot over that side. Okay. So it's just amazing to see you guys because you hear a lot by talking to a lot of the young women. They really get that not only best friend but maternal figure and their mentor. But the fact that you have both met was like really. Yeah. Um, it just feels good to see, you know, because I, I don't know, were you guys always this close or were there ever, you know, struggles early on? You know? Oh, definitely. Um, when I was using and drinking actively, I was not a good mother at all. You know, for 18 years, I lived a really difficult, traumatic lifestyle. It was like that street lifestyle where there is no other world. Like this living in an apartment and having a family didn't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. And maybe this is like the first time I'm realizing it. Maybe it's like the first time that I'm realizing it that guys that I was the, uh, you know, I, they were pimps. They were men that use, you know, young girls who were getting, who were using, who had a habit to also get high themselves. Um, and to get money for their drugs. And I think that I pushed that part away for a long, long time. Until now. Um, it's funny because I've said, I used to, I used to, I'd go to meetings and go, I, <laughs> Anne's laughing. I drank and I used and I did this and I never had a pimp. I swear I said that and it's so strange, because, but I did. I actually did. I, I did have men who would say, you know, you're going to go meet my friend. You're going to go meet my boy um, and he's going to give you this amount of money or he's going to give you this package, you know, but you got to sleep with them. You got to have sex with them. And that became my life, my everyday life. Um, are you all right? Yeah. Is there anything you don't want me to talk about? No. Okay. Um, I love you. <laughs> I love you. Yeah. I don't think, you know, your your history. She grew up hearing that, and, and then she like fell into it. You know, it's it's something that you know, you're talking about now with her. So, 
Is it just so common amongst young women? Is there a certain area? Like, what is it that you think that had this sort of cycle repeat? They didn't see, you know, well, you saw a lot. Mm -hmm. You did see a lot. You, so I think you saw more than um, I like to admit you, you did, right? Yeah. Yeah. But once I got clean and sober, I, like it was almost like my mission was to protect you guys from anything. So I thought that I kept everything in place enough to keep you safe. Like, let me just, let me just save you from it. Cause I know that I could, like at the time I was just like, I know I can save you. Just say something, just open your mouth and tell me so that I could fix it, you know? Search what her Facebook name or what was no, it? No, just uh, just for escort ads in Walpole. And so you didn't need much information. It took it took no technical ability. Anybody, the police could have done this. This is a New Hampshire ad for her. Police in any of these states could have um, looked hard. You know, basically what happened was that the police are overworked. They have a million kids who are missing. And, you know, me kind of slipped through the cracks, but I don't think that's the fault of, of some really dedicated police officers. I think it's the fault of a system that doesn't make this a priority and doesn't give them the resources they need. Something I didn't understand before this weekend is, is, the, is the fact that, like, handcuffs don't need to be tangible. I feel like and I've discovered it is, it is in a sense. this darkness that lives in our country in a way that... Um, I never knew before, you know, and I have a greater sense of the fact that not everybody is free. You know, women in these brothels in India, they don't have a relationship with right. with their captors. They're they are um, they are their abusers, and they, that is their relationship. They beat them, they abuse them. There is no love, there is no affection. They hold them down, they drug them, but yet these women. What they're kept by is the emotion. So you can run outside, but it doesn't mean you're, you're ever really away from it because you don't know what's real and what's not. That's you know? right. All right, so this wraps up the second uh, episode. We'll watch the third episode, the full thing on Friday. But um, for all the participants on all the other campuses, I know we just have like a minute and a half, so I wanted to be able to um, allow everyone, if anyone on Neighbor Island wanted to speak or say anything, we, we have a, a minute and a half. Uh, this was our attempt to do women's rights or human rights, a statewide seminar on ending sex trafficking in Hawaii, and to begin the conversation and work with all, all the groups that are already working on this on a daily basis. We'll also have an event though that'll be tomorrow at the Hawaii State Capitol. It's our 11th annual Human Rights Day and we'll be showing the whole film there as well but there's a whole list of different activities. We'll be meeting also at the public access room and they'll be sharing some of the bills that are looking at sex trafficking. I have a question from Hawaii. Hilo. Sure, Hilo. Could I have a question from Hilo? Yes. Could you tell us how to have access to this film? How can we have it available? Yeah, uh, I'll see if, since we were able to get the grant to show it here, if we can arrange that we can have a UNA event as well over in Hilo. If that would uh, be thank some you. And, to you. Uh, one other question. The first speaker in Manoa mentioned that she had contacts in the Outer Islands. Does she have any contact on this topic on the island of Hawaii? Okay, you have 15 seconds, so you want to be quick so you don't cut off. And is your mic on? You got, just to say real quick, maybe you could give them your contact information. Okay, our contact information, if you'll just email me, I'll get you that information. But my name is Missy, M-I-S-S-Y dot Sterney, S-T-U-R-N-E-Y, 
at H-O-O-L-A-N-A-P-U-A dot org. Okay, that's about it. All you got there. I'll also, if you want, because it, it cuts off at right at 1.30, um, we can email the people in Hilo that we're working with, or I'll send them your email. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.